my name's Nick Halls, and um, I am a writer, director, producer. Um, I'm an editor. I'm a cameraman occasionally, not very good, but uh, I guess today I'm speaking to you in the capacity as a producer. I got started probably back in high school. Um, I actually, I, I'm acting like I don't know what it was. I know exactly what it was. There was a um, a fan film competition to make a Star Wars fan film. I was a big Star Wars nerd and uh, I wanted to make a movie but I didn't really know how and there was a kid at my high school called Caleb McKenney who I've since worked with many many times and he's a very very talented filmmaker but I knew him as like the film guy so I went and approached Caleb and I was like you know what you know I want to do this and can you walk me through it now that movie never got made but um, our friendship has endured and we've worked on dozens and dozens of movies so I uh, went and studied media studies at RMIT and um, I chose something broad because I, I didn't know exactly where in the film industry I wanted to be so I went and studied something broad like media studies and um, since then, I have worked, you know, a whole variety of things. I've, I've worked as sort of a production assistant at small um, production companies around Melbourne. Um, we, you know, shooting football games and weddings and um, little 8 mil telecine services and things like that. Um, I've worked you know, worked my way up through uh, production assisting roles, uh, you know, with, with production companies and, and uh, driving on, the, on HBO's The Pacific. Um, and the whole time, I've found it very difficult to sort of get forward momentum on a career. And um, so the whole time I was constantly making my own stuff and... Um, because obviously because the thought process was uh, if I don't do it no one's going to give me the chance so I just I've been making short films in all that time and then about three years ago I moved up uh, to Sydney um, and like I said I had already been editing and and writing and all of that sort of stuff in my own time teaching myself and working on community television and stuff like that um, so when I moved up to Sydney three years ago I sort of rolled the dice and got myself a job as an editor and it's been great, you know, and, and in in the three years, sorry, in the three years that I've been here, I've just made a really fantastic support network of filmmakers and we've gone from, uh, yeah, me basically being a production assistant to having produced my first feature film. In an effort to meet film uh, like-minded filmmakers, in Sydney, I joined a meetup group, uh, a screenwriters meetup group. Uh, I've always been really, really interested in writing and um, the role that story and structure plays in, um, not just in filmmaking, but also understanding why it works on audiences and, and how you can control the idea of the film. Um, so uh, I, I went along to this meetup group and there I met uh, another aspiring filmmaker called Tim Lee and um, we made a Tropfest film together called Nursery Crimes um, and he, he wrote that, I produced it and we did it in that way because Tim had never made a movie before um, and so he had he had written many, but he had never made one, and I had made dozens um, of, of shorts, of course. Um, and so he, he was like, "Let's get this off the ground." I said, "Okay, that's fine." Um, and uh, you know, we got the team on board. So that was our first thing that we worked on together. And then about twelve months later, uh, we made another short film for um, a science fiction film festival uh, called Project Sci-Fi. Uh, it was the first year that it had been run, but it was in Parramatta. Um, and basically, I'm, like I was saying, I'm really into science fiction. And I signed us up for it. And 
asked if Tim wanted to get involved and he's always very eager to make content, you know. So uh, we came up with this idea together for uh, the, the, the confine or the, the setup of the competition, Project Sci-Fi, is that you have 30 days to write, uh, produce and post-produce a, a 10 minute short film. And um, we, so, so knowing that we went into it going like, well, how do we achieve that? In, in, how do we achieve like a good film in such a short amount of time? So we said, you know, let's, let's do a film where people are stuck in one location. It, that saves us a lot of time in terms of having to move about. And what are, what are interesting scenarios um, where that could happen? You know, I, I know there's thousands of possibilities, but we went with a post-apocalyptic uh, scenario, characters stuck in a, stuck in a, a nuclear fallout shelter. And, um, and we, obviously it's been, it's been done many times. The best versions are probably the Twilight Zone did it twice. Um, and I'm a big Twilight Zone fan. So we were trying to sort of make something that felt like a Twilight Zone episode. And, um, and then that film did it moderately, you know. It, it got nominated. It didn't win any awards, but it got nominated for some awards at, at the festivals it played at. And, um, and Tim was really, really... Um, I want to say buoyant, but that's probably the wrong word. He was really, really lifted by that that uh, it, enthusiasm from the audience that he said, "Let's turn this into a feature film." And um, I think my biggest uh, set or hurdle that I ever face when I'm I'm making a movie is that um, fear of failure, fear of it not being good enough. And to Tim's credit. Um, I think that he doesn't have that fear. I think that um, Tim, or, or if he has it, he hides it. I think Tim goes, let's just make it. Let's just do it and we'll do it as best we can and let's get it out into the world. So he was the driving force to begin with, uh, but again, didn't have as much production experience as I did. So he asked me to, to come on board as a producer and, and that's how it all got started really. Um, we, we took the idea of the short, we expanded it into a feature. He wrote and directed it and I produced it. The festival that we did it for was uh, called Project Sci-Fi. And early on, after we had decided we were going to make a feature film, we spoke to them about it happening. Um, we were looking for any form of support and one of the things that they said is that um, even at that early stage, they were planning on expanding Project Sci-Fi into a fully-fledged sci-fi festi film festival. And they were going to want to start showing some feature films. So it was mutually beneficial for us and them. They said, uh, you know, we want to show potential success from Project Sci-Fi. This is where it could lead. You guys are going to make a film over the next 12 months. How about we premiere your movie? Um, and... And we were told at the time, I think, that it was August or September that it was going to show. Now, we know now that it's November 16th. That's when it's happening. But we were working with sort of an, uh, an August-September deadline. And that affected every decision we made in pre-production, every decision we made in production, because we thought we only had about eight months to make this whole film. So... Um, Tim, uh, being the writer, took the script and uh, from the short and, ex and started expanding it. He needed to get it to 90 to 100 pages. We didn't want it overly long because it was going to be impossible to film in the tiny amount of time that we had. Um, but obviously we wanted it feature length. So he started working on the story for it and because we were working in such a tight deadline we probably didn't push the script as far as we all would have liked for it to to go um i know that i um gave lots and lots and lots of rounds of feedback um on the on the various levels of the script and tim was rehearsing with the actors and they were giving feedback as well and 
and he was doing everything, you know, he was getting coverage done on the script. So he was doing everything he could to um, have that script as ready as possible. But really, um, aside from providing feedback on it, I wasn't super involved in the writing of it. It was my job in those sort of first, I guess about three, three and a half months, was to put together everything else about the film. So I started building the crew, um, a lot of whom came from a short film I worked on at the end of last year, um, directed by Matthew Graham, called Yes, I'm Serious. And um, so I started, there was a lot of crew on there that I thought these guys are really talented and I had a really good time working with them. And the thing that I've learned from making a lot of short films is that um, uh, enthusiasm trumps experience every single time. I would absolutely rather make a film with people that I have fun, who are into it and, and who I have a really good time with on set, um, even if their knowledge isn't as great as, you know, potentially, you know, there might be some amazing uh, filmmaker who, who wants to be involved, but if we're all going to clash and have a terrible time making it, it's just, it's not worth it. So, yeah, basically the... The process of pre-production was then um, about getting money together and we chose to crowdfund the movie. Um, and I had, because I'd never done anything this big, we got a, a second producer on board um, uh, by the name of Ravi uh, Cambodge. And um, Ravi had done a few like independent films and um, really... I saw Ravi's involvement in the film almost like a safety net for me in that um, I took the lead in a lot of areas, um, but there were some things that I, I, did, I either didn't know no, enough about or I didn't know that we were going to have a problem, if that makes sense. You know, like you don't know what you don't know. So I thought, well, that's fine because if we ever f encounter those scenarios, I'll be able to turn to Ravi and he'll have done it before and I'll be able to say, what do I do here, you know? Um, and so we crowdfunded the film and I don't know how much you want me to talk about the crowdfunding. Sure, but um, yeah, that was a really difficult, arduous experience. And uh, I don't know that I'm sold on crowdfunding, but as it was, we got enough to, you know, get get going on the film. And then it was a race against the clock, you know, like we had so much to do. Um, obviously the, the crew was mostly in place, but we had to build a set. Um, and it was just about how do we find time to do it because the film was done on such a tiny budget. Um, we couldn't, no one could afford to take large chunks of time off work. Um, in addition to the time we were all taking off for the shoot to, you know, run around and work full time on this film. The majority of the film takes place in a nuclear shelter and the director of photography, Nat Jackson, um, I don't want to say he put his foot down because it makes him sound awful, but it, it became fairly clear early on that in order to shoot the amount of content that we needed to shoot in the amount of time that we had allocated, he was really going to need just full control over absolutely everything. Uh, so we, it was, it was very quickly agreed that we weren't going to be able to shoot on a, just say a bunker looking set. We had looked at sort of old bomb shelters and, and um, you know, our underground bunkers. And what we needed was to be able to move walls at, at will. We needed uh, lots of power because we needed to be able to rig up lights that essentially weren't ever going to get turned off. They were just going to stay there and they were going to be our lighting sources, things like this that we really needed to be able to control and that a um, pre-existing location wouldn't provide us. So we had to build a set um, and we needed a, lo uh, a studio to do that in, obviously, because we needed good sound. We needed nice, clean sound and we needed access to a lot of power. And, you know, there were things like um, gunshots in the movie that... Um, you know, you need you need a soundproof location to do that. Um, you need 
if you're going to have smoke effects or fire effects or anything like that, you need a, a place set up for it. So we needed a proper studio and we needed it cheap. And um, after we had searched for a while and we just sort of called around to different people and whatnot and not really found anything that was going to fit our budget and our time frame, um, Ravi was speaking with someone that he went to university with and, um, and they happened to work at a studio out in French's Forest called C3 Studios. C3 is a big church complex um, and a lot of their big buildings, uh, as far as I understand it, the, um, uh, the, the church proper, um, they film a lot of um, sermons and they film a lot of events there. And that's all set up as a TV studio. And then they have smaller TV studios attached to it. Um, and we were going to shoot over Easter. So they actually didn't need access to the TV studios for a lot of that period. They were shooting a lot in the, in the church proper. And um, so they gave us a really, really good deal. And um, basically the deal, you know, aside from it being um, very, very cheap for us to do, they were also going to let us have access to a lot of facilities and essentially stay out of our hair and let us do whatever we wanted inside that studio, you know? Um, and uh, that, so that was the major location. Um, we, sh there's, there's a little bit of the film that takes place um, in exteriors and that, that was shot in Woolloomooloo. Um, we found a place on Airbnb who were, which looked right and were very willing for us to um, shoot there. And it gave us like a nice, I guess it opened the scope of the film up, you know. Um, building the set was, um, at the time, really, really daunting. But now that I've done it, I think, oh, we could, we could do it again in a heartbeat. In fact, uh, once you've, I guess once you've done it once, you know, you refine how you would do it. So I think that we could do it even better if we did it again, you know. Um, we... I'm not a carpenter, but I had to learn a lot of new skills. Um, luckily, we had um, uh, our sound guy, Pat Hardigan, um, had some experience with some woodwork and, and some uh, building and things like that. Um, I don't want to say carpentry because I'm not certain that's 100% correct, but uh, he, he knew a lot more about how how to practically achieve things. So he did the difficult stuff like uh, the, the door that we were going to use that was the bunker door, the big heavy bunker door um, and the really tricky stuff he did and, and um, essentially the way the set came together was the director of photography designed it how he would need it to be to, for, for us to make it worthwhile doing you know like if, if it wasn't going to suit his purposes we were wasting our time so he designed it how he needed it to be um, and then I sat down with the production designer and we figured out how that was going to be achievable. Um, you know, where were, we, where were we going to get the materials from? How are we going to texture it? How are we going to paint it? How was it going to be assembled? How are we going to make it so that um, it was 90% customizable as we were shooting? Things like walls would have to come out, go in. The only piece that couldn't be moved when we were shooting the film was the piece right in the center um, simply because it was thick um, but because you would have to see both sides of it there was no way to um, give it enough support at the base so we had to uh, attach it to the lighting grid above and that just meant that you know if we had have wanted to move that it would have just taken a very very long time to get up and um, unrig it, you know, and, and disconnect it and then move those pieces. So essentially the, the center wall of the bunker, um, which was sort of the bunker itself was a six by six um, meter concrete uh, structure underground um, at the base of like a, an apartment building. Yeah, the only piece that couldn't be moved was that, that center wall. And then, um, yeah, we spent the week before production be, uh, began before we began ro rolling cameras um, I spent that time there with uh, at C3 studios with our production designer and our art director 
um, and a number of different volunteers. Um, and, you know, we were literally spent the time, you know, cutting, cutting wood and, uh, you know, applying texture and render and uh, painting it all up and then detailing it. You know, there's little, just tiny little things in the film. Um, like, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a small section that's supposed to be the bathroom. So we had to figure out, you know, just how, how we're going to arrange that and where the shower's going to go and where's the um, drainage happening in the bunker, you know, and, and then detailing that. And um, yeah, essentially, once we had figured out where all the um, dressing and, and whatnot goes, there were a lot of holes, literal, I don't mean like badly made set. I mean like a lot of holes that we cut into the set because we were going to need to put cameras pretty much everywhere, um, again, to make it interesting and to be able to shoot it as quickly as we wanted to.